folks, folks, it seems that we have liftoff here. Can I get it? Get your attention, please? We're going to go ahead and get started. Our technical problems have been sort of resolved. Anyway, we need to go ahead and introduce um, Cindy Campbell, our fourth in ASL lecture series. And she was a she's a former student. She graduated here a few years ago. And she is teaching in the Department of Sign Language Interpreter Education here. She's going to explain a little bit about her, um, her dissertation and her, for her PhD. And so I'd like to welcome Cindy Campbell. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Barbara Ray, for the introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and also I'm thrilled to show you my work. I think this is very exciting. Last year, I was teaching a class at the uh, University of Albany, and I wondered, it made me think about what I would learned about ASL thus far. So it made me, it inspired me to research more closely some poetry and eloquence. And that's very rich. I found out ASL and poetry is very, very rich. So these are the results from, the pro from my research. Now, it's not finished, mind you. The research will go on and lead to more research. This is a semiotic analysis of ASL poetry. Sounds more complicated than it is. I'm going to go on and explain a little bit more depth, and you'll, I'm sure you'll understand very clearly by the end of my presentation. Okay? So let me start with some overheads for you. Now, the project that I'm speaking to you about was an in-depth study of ASL in a linguistic manner. So, as I've been teaching over the years, I've taught many students, and I'm finding that they're lear we're concentrating on sign use, learning the signs for mother and father and soda pop. And then when you get out in the world, it, the students found that it was very awkward still. As I researched them and I analyzed them, I couldn't figure out what was going on with them, why they were so awkward once they got out into the real world. That led to my research, because there was a question unanswered for me. And I think that this will improve our pedagogy in future years, if we can answer a few questions. It will also help students in socializing and being more eloquent with the language. Okay, thus far, the research, which is plentiful, we've been we've been focusing on ASL structure, and narrative, and discourse. We have named and labeled and analyzed all of it. We have structure. We we know that ASL has grammar and and pet syntax. We we know all of that. Still not quite satisfied. There needs to be more research, and that's the intent of my analyzation here. Okay, so secondly, my master's thesis was very critical that that answers that question, that question that kept bothering me for five years. It was very important for me to answer that question, so that was the reason for my master's thesis. My master's thesis wanted to focus on how deaf speakers, deaf signers, achieved eloquence in their narratives. So a symbiotic analysis is therefore attached to deaf eloquence, eloquence of speakers. So I went to a lot of deaf people that I knew, deaf friends and colleagues, and asked them to name for me a person that they remember in their schooling or any time that they've met a person in their life that was beautifully eloquent in the use of ASL. They all named different people, some teachers that they'd had, some friends that they'd known. Once I got gathered all that information, I asked them, why was that person eloquent? What made them eloquent? The answers that I got were that the signing was beautiful, their use of the language was beautiful, and, and they were clear, they, they understood how to use the language in a beautiful way. This wasn't sufficient for me. I needed to know more, so I asked them to show me. I asked them to show me why the person was so eloquent. They couldn't answer me. I said, that's the question I need to answer. And that's why I did my master's thesis on that. Okay. 
I already kind of explained to you that this will lead to teaching tools for us in the future. Now, I want to focus on ASL discourse first. So I want to show you my studies and what I found in the structure of ASL and in poetry. Now, I don't know how much you've taken of sign language. Some of you are more proficient than others, and some of you are linguists, indeed, in the audience. So now, when we're speaking language, what is a word? Like the word cake. Okay, you have a tone of voice when you say cake. There's a sound, cake. There's the production, There's the production of it. But if you pull that, pull that word apart a little bit, you can find the sound, this sound, k. That sound a, another sound k, another the end sound a, cake. Signs have the same thing. We can pull apart the different signs and separate them into their phonemes, morphemes, if you will. Okay. So example, the sign mother. Can you all see this mother? Okay. It has five what we'll call parameters. Okay. Phonological components. And here they are. We have the hand shape, okay? It's a five, correct? A five hand shape. Next, we want to look at its location. Where is the sign produced? Right here, under the mouth and the chin, correct? Thirdly, we have movement. Does the sign move? There is a small movement with the sign mother, yes. You can do it, you can move it a couple of times or you can move it once. The fourth thing we look at is palm orientation whether the palm is facing our reader or facing toward ourselves or facing to the right side or the left side, okay? And the last is the non-manual markers that go with mother. The sign mother doesn't require any non-manual markers necessarily, so this is how we split apart the word or, if you will, the sign mother. All of these three, four, five things together make the sign mother, okay? It's important now that the sign for mother is moved just a little bit up to the forehead and there's one difference between the sign for mother and the sign for father and that is location makes a different sign okay so that's critical that's in critical if one little component is changed you get a different sign This might seem a little complex, but let me go ahead and uh, explain this to you. Semiotics. Doesn't mean sign. It's not the word sign. Sign means what? Like that is a sign. So, that's a sign. Nose, that's a sign. My mouth, that's a sign. Everything is a sign. Every gesture is a sign. Okay, that's not what I mean. Everything has the potential to be a sign. So when we get a sign, it has a process. How we study signs. Peirce, in his work, he's a famous American philosopher back in, around the turn of the century, about 1905. Um, his work was focused on semiotics. He discussed everything in the world, the world of man. When people get a thought, it in, they interpret all of this information in their heads and come out and produce symbols. And everything in the world is connected to everything else. Everything is interpreted as a sign or a word or a concept and it becomes Everything is connected, okay? Now, I have to show you his model so that we can put all this together. This is Purse's model, okay? Now, I want to show you, here's one with a referent. The referent, I want to tell you what that means, okay? My shoes, my clothes, that's a referent. My hair. That's a referent, okay? Anything, one thing, <coughs> anything that is one thing, like hair or chair or whatever, that's a referent, an object, okay? Suppose you see a person and you see their hair. 
how do we get the symbol H-A-I-R? We got to connect the symbol with the thing, the object, hair. Okay, that becomes the interpretation into a sign symbol. Okay, that's the process. Are we clear on that? Let me show you some more. Podium. Okay, I see this. I see its shape. I see its color. Let's see what it looks like. This thing. How do I connect to that? How I connect to that is with language. Okay, I need to make a symbol, a word, if you will, for that. Podium. Okay, now that thing represents podium. Okay. The word podium represents the thing. Now, let's talk about language. Now, there are a million different signs, right? Now, Peirce had three groups of signs. Symbols. That means linguistic words. You have to have an agreed-upon system of communication, a language, if you will, an agreed-upon system of, of words that represent objects, okay? So what's the sign for this, what, I, like what I'm wearing? What's the sign for this? Okay, dress. Good. Dress is the sign for this. Fine. Now the deaf community agrees, we all agree, if you will, to sign dress for that, for that object. Now if I'm talking to a person from another country and I sign dress, what we in America have agreed upon as the sign for dress, they may not understand that. It doesn't mean the same thing to them. Their people have a different sign for dress. Okay. So it's an abstract concept that we have to agree upon what labels we will use and what symbols we will use to define the object. Okay. Okay. Now the next group from purse is icons. Now icons are easy. An icon means something that makes a connection. Now, suppose I sign drink. Okay, that's easy. You would understand that even if you didn't know sign language, right? Now, if I go again to Europe or to another country and I sign drink, it's very clear. It so clearly represents the action of that object that another, any other person on the planet would know what I was talking about. The next group of, of, of components from purse is indexes. Now let's put English aside here and let's talk about ASL, okay? Indexing, do you see what I'm doing here? Indexing means referring back to something, okay? Say I'm, I'm signing this about a car and I use this classifier for the, to represent the car, vehicle. the vehicle, okay? That's referencing back. ASL is, makes high use of referencing. If I say I sign my mother and I put my mother in my left position here, or in my right position, then I can reference back to my mother on my left position or on my right position, and you know who I'm talking about. Suppose I have a, a big bowl of salad in front of me, and I use the classifier, but I, can, I maintain the size and shape of that bowl as I move the, the, the bowl from the table to the sink. That's referencing back. Okay, I think you understand what I mean. ASL is very rich in indexicality. First, I want to show you a little data. Okay, actually, let me show you a movie first real quick. It's important that poetry... There was a one, one little girl on here. It was so cute. She's talking about a horse and a cow. It's just one minute. It's a very short story, but it is beautiful. Her use of language is just beautiful. I want to show you that first and then I want to analyze the data with you.
simple little story, but beautifully done. Wow, and a lot of analyzing potential there. Okay, so before I show you the data now, let's analyze that, which is real important. When you go to an English class, you've all taken English classes, right? Writing classes. Okay, when you write a paper, how do you start? What's your process? What's the first thing you do? Okay, you make an opening, right? An introduction, opening statement, opening paragraph. Yes, right. What's the second part of your paper? A body. Good. Mm -hmm. Body that is have however many paragraphs. What's the last part of your presentation or the last part of your paper? A conclusion. Correct. So, the opening, the body, and the conclusion is in written language. Okay, now, ASL students, when they produce narrative, they have the three same components, okay? I'm going to go a little deeper into each of those with this data. I want to show you. Okay, so I'm going to let you know how we're going to analyze this. Oops. Can you all see? <laughs> okay. Okay. So when you start to analyze this, I got this and I didn't know exactly how to analyze this data. So I thought, let me break it into columns. I'll have a one column, a two column, and a three column. I, I was a little bit awkward with this at first, and I was talking to a teacher colleague of mine. They suggested that I follow what the person does as far as their movement to their right side, their middle, or their left side, where the signs are placed. And that made things all work out very well. So that worked. Okay, you can see it up here. That's for the right side. Okay. Here's the middle. And left. Okay? So that's where the signs are produced. So, see what happens here in the middle space? The little girl talked about the farm and talked about the cows and set the cows up. And you could see the rooster then, and the rooster was set up. Okay? All of that was basically in the middle frame, okay, in her middle space of her body. Do you see all this down here later on in the poem or later on in the narrative? Do you see the Y hand shape, the Y hand shape? And you see down here the um, the three classifier, the three hand shape. And then in the middle, we have two hands and the five classifier. Okay, and then down at the end again. So there's three specific hand shapes that she used. She used the three, the Y, and the five hand shapes. Okay? So the five is important. The five hand shape is important because when you're shifting your body, I wondered why do people shift their bodies? Well, obviously that's for a roll shift, okay? For a comparing and a contrasting. Okay? This is what's happening. When I shift to my left, this character takes on the role and does the speaking. Now, when I shift to my right, there's another character. I become another character, and I do the, the narrative for that character. Okay, So this has a definite linguistic purpose. Role taking. Role shifting. Okay, so... Whoops, wait a minute. <laughs> I've lost my technology. Ah, there we go. Okay. okay, it only slept. It only took a nap. Okay. Now that role shifting, that body shifting, that is indexing. Okay, that's our left column, where all the where the Y happened, and then our right column is where the three hand shape ha column ha three hand shape happened, and then in the middle is where the five hand shape happened. Okay, so we have the cow on the left, which is right. Our cow on the left, which is the Y hand shape. The rooster on the right, which is the three hand shape and in the middle you had the five hand shape which was representing the farm so now so you have your three your five and your y hand shapes so who represents the 
who is the three representing? The rooster. Who does the Y represent? The cow. And what does the five handshape represent? The farm. All those three are indexed over and over again, and often at the same time. The reason for that is because that makes a linguistic connection. You can switch your body, and you become that character. At the same time, that's an icon because there's movement involved. You can see how the cow moves, how the rooster walks, how the cow chews its cud. You can see the weight and the movement of each character. That's index, indexing, and it's also iconic, icon, iconographic. And that's called metonymy. Okay, because you're combining two or three different parts. That's metonymy. Metonymy means two parts acting in the same time. You have indexing and you have iconic representation simultaneously. simultaneously. That's very abstract, very rich. That story shows that the reason that a lot of hearing students who are learning sign language are very awkward their first two or three years because they don't understand the complexities of what they're doing. We don't understand the complexities of what, they're, what the language can, can do. But I didn't understand that for quite a long time. I understand I was just teaching them signs and I didn't understand why they were not getting the, the eloquence and the complexities. This research has led me to understand why that is. They were not taught the indexing or the iconing. Iconicity and indexing. Okay, now let's look at the beginning, the middle, and the ending, going back to how we write a paper, right? The, the introduction, the body, and the conclusion, okay? Let's, let's connect that to our story. Now, do you see all this that's happening up here in the middle section? Using more signs. Farm, cow, rooster. Now, do you see this later on in the story, what's happening? There aren't any words. There aren't any symbols. <coughs> Symbol use goes way down in the middle and end of the story. And then at the end, the words or the symbols crop up again. So, I was analyzing how people use this language. And what happens is, in the beginning of a story or a poem, there's heavy symbol use. Then in, as we reach the middle of the story or, or poem, symbol use goes decreases and icon and indexing use increases. So that poem has structure embedded. It's all, it's, it purely, purely has structure. We know that. When I started realizing what kind of structure was involved and realizing how the structure was connected to the eloquence and the production, it all started to make sense. And this three-column grid is what I came up with. So the narrative structure is deeper than you think. It's not just an opening, introduction, a body, and a closing. It has a lot more to it. There's more depth and more richness to it, to the structure, than what we originally, than what we originally thought. Now, related to the data, there's two tests in my thesis, okay? Analyzing the structure, and also I wanted to test a narrative and how the structure applies to the narrative, okay? Or if it applies, it's okay. I wanted to focus on poetry, because storytelling and narrative is very different than poetry. I wanted to see if my thesis applied to it, and it found that stories had followed the same principles as poetry, but, there's one difference. The opening is strong.
long symbol use. The opening is, is, is very high in symbol use. The, the middle, the body of the story, is pretty similar to poetry. There's a lot of acting, a lot of gesturing, a lot of role shifting and indexing. Okay, a lot of you using the eyebrows up as in topic sentences, that's in heavy use with symbols. And in the middle of the in the middle of the story, icon and indexing increases and symbol use decreases and then you get a new topic in the middle. And then you have your conclusion and symbol use again rises for the conclusion. So I analyzed stories. That's the part I watched a lot of videotapes, needless to say, and did a lot of analyzation of the stories. One thing I noticed, one pattern that I noticed that didn't fit my thesis, didn't fit my hypothesis, and that was using the Y hand shape. I wondered why, I wondered why, and then I realized that there were many characters involved. And the character, there are five characters in the story. So that's too much for a dialogue. There's too many characters. It's impossible to use this structure when there's more than just a couple of characters, more than three characters. It's impossible. That's why the structure needs to have a little bit. We need to research the structure a little bit more, the structural component a little bit more. Now, structure, of course, is critical. That can help us understand and analyze signs, mental organization, how we interpret, internalize, interpret, and then produce the language. So, so can, there's a lot of words when you write a paper, right? It's highly contextualized. It still has its own structure. Okay, the opening, the middle, the closing, or the introduction, the body, the conclusion, they all have its own structure, okay? In ASL, icons and indexes, I wondered where they came from. Context. It comes from context. It comes from the general world, how we see things. How we internalize and interpret our world. And then it becomes iconic. So it comes from the context. So that, that tells me that hearing people and deaf people think differently. ASL and deaf people are following a symbiotic process, a symbiotic process. That's why the structures are different. Okay, now we come to the interesting part, future research. I think it's important that we do research in the, in the future about researching hearing structure and deaf structure, if you will. They are not the same. What ways they're similar? What ways they're different? And why? And why? I think we need to do a comparison. Then, I wonder when we do that comparison, we need to find ways that it will influence our teaching. We'll find new teaching tools. We're not going to be just teaching vocabulary words to hearing students. We're going to be teaching them more in depth about the structure, the process, and the, semiotic. and the semiotics. Okay. I'm not sure how many questions are left, but the research needs to continue. That research is helping me to go ahead and develop some future teaching tools that will be more effective in the classroom. Yeah. Now, here we are, my conclusion. <laughs> the meaning of the study is, the purpose of this study was for my graduate thesis. I had so, I had this burning question I, I, that I had no answer for, carried it with me night and day. Then I went into the research, found what else was involved in the eloquence of ASL? The signs, yes, but there was the the indexing, the iconogra the iconographic components. 
the structure was very rich, very deep. Think of the World Wide Web. Think, excuse me, interpreter error, not a World Wide Web. Think of the web, a spider web. Think of all the connections. It's not just one strand. It's many strands combined in a specific way. It has a specific structure. And if you take one piece out, it will fall apart. So the semiotic method is how one relates to the world, how one interprets the world. You attach labels to objects, yes, signs to objects, but there's more to it than that. So we went through Peirce's study, his theory. Now I've got all the data together. We've done some data analysis, come up with symbols, icons, indexes, and how those three interact and form a very complex structure. It's more than just the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. Much more than that. Next, the results, as you've seen. Then the discussion. The discussion leads to future research that I hope will hold many more answers. So now, there's some linguists in the audience or whatever. It's your job, perhaps, to go on and do some more research. And thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, ask her to rewind the videotape and so you could do, see it where it had the Y hand shape, the three hand shape, and then the five hand shape in the middle. And thank you all for coming today. Now everyone who wants RID CEU, sign up over where the uh, FM units are. And the next um, ASL lecture series will be on May 5th. And it's going to be Berman. He's going to be our last uh, presenter on May 5th for the ASL Lecture Series for this year. Now, if you have any ideas for the future ASL Lecture Series, please submit any names or topics that you would like to have covered. You can contact myself or Susan Fish and Fisher or Colleen Puglio, and please submit those ideas and names. Okay, so here we go. Once again, the cow and the... Whoops. A cow and the rooster. Do you have any questions for Cindy? Uh, we will be meeting in room four, 1530. We're just around the corner here. Oh, I'm sorry. It's in room 1530. Thank you. Thank you again, Cindy. Let's hear it for Cindy Campbell. Thank you for coming today. Thank you.